Greetings, and welcome to the VF Corporation third quarter fiscal 2020 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It's now my pleasure to introduce your host, Joe Alkire. Please go ahead. Good morning, and welcome to VF Corporation's third quarter fiscal 2020 conference call. Participants on today's call will make forward-looking statements. These statements are based on current expectations and are subject to uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially. These uncertainties are detailed in documents filed regularly with the SEC. Unless otherwise noted, amounts referred to on today's call will be on an adjusted, constant dollar basis, which we define in the press release that was issued this morning. We use adjusted, constant dollar amounts as lead numbers in our discussion because we believe they more accurately represent the true operational performance and underlying results of our business. You may also hear us refer to reported amounts which are in accordance with U.S. GAAP. Reconciliations of GAAP measures to adjusted amounts can be found in the supplemental financial tables included in the press release which identify and quantify all excluded items and provide management's view of why this information is useful to investors. During the first quarter of fiscal 2020, the company completed the spinoff of its jeans business, which included the Wrangler League and Rock and Republic brands, as well as the VF outlet business, into an independent, publicly traded company under the name Contour Brands. Accordingly, the company has removed the assets and liabilities of the jeans business as of the date noted above and included the operating results of this business and discontinued operations for all periods presented. Unless otherwise noted, results presented on today's call are based on continuing operations. Joining me on today's call will be VF's Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer Steve Rendell and Chief Financial Officer Scott Rowe. Following our prepared remarks, we'll open the call for questions. Steve? Thank you, Joe, and good morning, everyone. Our third quarter performance was strong and our year-to-date results are at the high end of our long-term growth objectives, and we're on track to deliver solid performance this year, and we're well-positioned for continued growth and value creation in fiscal 21. Before we review our third quarter results and adjusted outlook for the year, I'd like to take a moment and comment on the news we disclosed Tuesday morning regarding our intent to explore strategic alternatives for the occupational work portion of our work segment, hereafter referred to as occupational work brands. Scott will cover the specifics, but I'd like to highlight a few messages from the announcement materials. Driving and optimizing our portfolio continues to be a top strategic priority for VF, and exploring strategic alternatives for our occupational work brands is the next natural step in that process. Our decision reflects management's continued focus on transforming VF into a more consumer-minded, retail-centric enterprise with a portfolio of more growth-oriented outdoor active, and work brands. First, it is important to note that the Dickies and Dillon Pro brands are part of our review. We remain fully committed to these brands, as well as our worthy work purpose territory. There are fundamental differences between the occupational work brands and the Dickies and Timberland Pro brands, including the ability to connect directly with consumers, distribution footprint, supply chain infrastructure, and financial profile. The leadership teams within our occupational work brands have done an excellent job building these businesses over many years, putting VF in an ideal position to find the best future owner for these brands to better enable their next phase of growth and success. In terms of timing, the review process is underway, and we will keep you appraised as things evolve over the next few months. Now, let's review our third quarter results in the current state of our business. As we head into the final quarter, we remain confident in our ability to deliver another strong year at the high end of our long-range plan. Year-to-date, organic, constant dollar revenue and EPS increased 8% and 16% respectively, driven by our two largest brands and our international and D2C growth platforms. Our strategic growth drivers performed well over the holiday season, and we are well positioned as we look toward fiscal 2021. For the quarter, revenue increased 6%, or 7%, excluding the occupational work brands just discussed. While our revenue performance for the quarter was generally in line with our long-term algorithm, 
It was slightly below our expectations due primarily to the performance at Timberland, more challenging conditions in our occupational work brands, as well as a mixed holiday season in the U.S. Despite the revenue shortfall, the quality of our growth remains strong, as evidenced by 100% basis points of gross margin expansion, 12% operating income growth, and 14% EPS growth. Our performance during the quarter highlights the diversity and resiliency of our operating model and the momentum we have across our strategic growth drivers. And now let me turn to the performance of our largest brands. SPANS continues to deliver strong, balanced performance across all regions and above its stated long-term growth objective. Revenue for VANS increased 13% in the quarter, and importantly, growth remains well diversified across product categories, channels, and geographies. Heritage footwear increased 8%, progression increased more than 30%, and apparel increased 14%. Following another quarter of broad-based momentum, we are again raising our fiscal 2020 outlook for VANS. We now expect revenue for VANS to increase about 15% for the full year, well ahead of its long-term target. Moving on to the North Face, revenue increased 8% in the quarter, led by our international business. Growth was balanced across both our D2C and wholesale channels globally, and we saw solid performance in our urban exploration and mountain lifestyle product territories as the brand continues to attract new consumers and capitalize on growth opportunities beyond the core mountain sports. Footwear also increased at a high single-digit rate during the quarter. In mountain sports, strong performance internationally was somewhat offset by more mixed results in the U.S. market. While limited in scope, the performance of FutureLight well exceeded our expectations during the key holiday season and continues to cast a strong halo for the brand. The disruptive innovation has been available to consumers for about four months now, and we're seeing four times the sales volume in our Pinnacle Summit, Steep, and Flight Series products, which feature the FutureLight technology. Given our holiday performance and additional visibility through the end of the year, we now expect revenue for the North Face to increase about 9% at the high end of its long-term growth objective. Despite early signs of success this year, our results at Timberland were disappointing this holiday season as revenue decreased 4% in the quarter. Solid momentum in apparel, outdoor footwear, and China was not enough to offset challenging conditions in men's footwear in the Americas and Europe, particularly in our classic business. Men's, non-classics, and women's performed relatively better as our diversification strategy continues to evolve. As a result of the third quarter performance and improved visibility through the rest of the year, we are lowering our revenue outlook for the Timberland brand in fiscal 2020 and now expect full year revenue to decline between 1 and 2%. And last but not least, as expected, the Dickies brand had a great quarter as revenue increased 13%. Growth was strong across all key strategic growth drivers, highlighted by 68% growth in China and 16% growth in digital, with category momentum across icons and new seasonal product. After a flat first half, we had high expectations for the Dickies brand heading into the back half of this fiscal year, and the global teams delivered. The brand launched its Yours to Make marketing campaign this quarter, the largest in brand history, driving significant brand heat and consumer engagement. We expect another quarter of double-digit growth, providing us with strong momentum as we head into fiscal 2021. We continue to be bullish about the growth opportunities at Dickey's and are even more confident in our fiscal 2020 revenue growth outlook of 5 to 6%. Over the last few quarters, we've we've discussed, discussed a more uncertain geopolitical and macroeconomic environment and the impact it has had on our business results and forward outlook. As we exit the holiday season, I'd like to briefly provide our perspective on business conditions across our largest markets. The U.S. economic backdrop remains generally solid, led by a healthy consumer and low unemployment. That said, we believe performance across retail and our sector was mixed during the holiday season. While inventory levels at retail were in good shape heading into the fall-winter period, sell-through performance in certain categories was slower than expected, which has led to elevated inventories in select areas and a more promotional environment. In Europe, international trade and the Brexit uncertainty have impacted business confidence and investment. However, consumer confidence and spending remains relatively strong. Our EMEA business accelerated in the third quarter, and our outlook is generally bullish across the region. In Asia, our brands continue to perform very well in China, despite continued unrest in Hong Kong. The recent Phase 1 trade deal between China and the U.S. should yield a more constructive consumer 
and retail environment. As I talked about in Beaver Creek, our strategy is to become more consumer-minded, retail-centric, and hyper-digital in all that we do. Transforming how we operate is essential to our ability to create value for shareholders and stakeholders. We are in the early stages of our journey, and as our work progresses, we increasingly gain clarity on what's required to achieve our vision. As we exit fiscal 2020 and transition into fiscal 2021, we will focus our investments on four key programs. The first is to gain a deeper understanding of new and existing consumers. We will further focus our investments on deriving proprietary, real-time consumer and marketplace knowledge to establish emotional connections, guide personalization, inspire must-have products, and create consumer-centric experiences that enable lifelong, loyal relationships. The second is developing a more digitally enabled, responsive go-to-market approach. We will increasingly leverage more end-to-end -end digital platforms, go-to-market processes, and best practices, and manufacturing innovations that help our brands create and deliver high-value products and experiences to consumers whenever and wherever they want. The third is a more seamless integration across physical and digital touch points. We will work to provide a seamless and consistent brand experience across and between all consumer touch points, be it digital, physical, owned and partner, and strategic wholesale accounts. The fourth is the construction of more robust engagement models that help build and create enduring relationships. We will invest and leverage best of breed marketing and technology platforms and enable our brands to drive new consumer acquisition and build stronger loyalty through personalized engagement. Our transformation journey is a multi-year endeavor. Investments over the past two and a half years have laid the foundation that we'll now begin to build on. We have an aggressive agenda and look forward to providing more details and updating you on our progress against these programs as the years unfold. Before turning the call over to Scott, I'd like to highlight that on December 5th, we launched our latest sustainability and responsibility report, Made for Change. This report outlines our aspirations for advancing environmental and social improvements across our enterprise and communities worldwide. Included in the report, we publicly announced new ambitious science-based targets and commitments around our use of sustainable materials aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Details behind these commitments, highlights from the last reporting year, and the value this work adds to our business and stakeholders can be found in the report. Consistent with our commitment to be a purpose-led enterprise, VF has established a clear position as a leader in the work to combat global climate change. Looking ahead and with our Made for Change strategy providing the roadmap, we will strengthen our role as a company that is leading meaningful initiatives that not only lessen our impact on the planet, but also drive purpose-led, profitable growth for our business and brands. And with that, I'll turn it over to Scott. Thanks, Steve, and good morning, everyone. We, are, we were pleased with our strong third quarter performance, and we remain on track to deliver revenue and earnings growth above our long-term commitments. Before we review our third quarter results and adjusted outlook in more detail, I'd like to make a few comments related to the announcement made Tuesday morning of our intent to explore strategic alternatives for the occupational work brands. In summary, we intend to sell the brands comprising our work segment, excluding the Dickies and Timberland Pro brands. The occupational work brands include VF's legacy imageware business, as well as several brands acquired with the Williamson Dickey transaction. As a reminder, this is primarily a B2B wholesale business and represents the majority of DF's existing owned manufacturing footprint. These brands tend to be more cyclical in nature and have minimal exposure to VF's international and D2C growth platforms. From a financial standpoint, the occupational work brands contributed about $865 million of revenue and $130 million of adjusted operating income in fiscal 2019. As Steve mentioned, the review process is underway, and we will provide further de details as the process unfolds over the next few months. So now let's review our third quarter results. Overall, our performance was strong. The brands and platforms that are core drivers of our long-term growth objectives performed well during the holiday season, and the fundamentals of our business remain intact. While parts of the portfolio did not fully meet our expectations, in aggregate, we were pleased with our results despite a mixed holiday season in the U.S. Our performance in the third quarter highlights the diversity and resiliency of both our portfolio and operating model, 
two themes we spoke about in detail during our investor day in Beaver Creek. For the third quarter, total VF revenue increased 6% organically. And if you exclude the occupational work brands, the growth rate becomes 7%, a full point higher driven by our largest brands. Growth was relatively balanced by channel in the third quarter as D2C increased 7%, including 17% growth in digital and a 6% total comp, and wholesale increased 4%. Moving on to our performance by geographic region, revenue increased 9% internationally and 3% in the U.S., including the occupational work brands. Strength internationally was driven by 15% growth in Asia, including more than 30% growth in China, which benefited by about five points from the timing of shipments ahead of the Chinese New Year holiday. Our EMEA business also delivered another solid quarter with 7% organic growth led by 13% D2C growth, including an 11% comp and 30% growth in digital. Our fundamentals remain strong as gross margin expanded 100 basis points organically, driven by continued favorable mix shift towards higher margin businesses and the timing of foreign currency transaction gains. Operating margin also expanded 100 basis points, representing 12% growth in operating profit despite a 9% increase in strategic investment spending. And excluding the occupational work brands, operating profit increased by 15%. And to round out the P&L, EPS increased 14% to $1.23, which includes the occupational portion of our work segment. Moving to the balance sheet, inventory, excluding the occupational work brands, increased 8%, or 12% for total VF. Our inventory is a little elevated. However, we're comfortable with the quality and expect inventory growth to be in line with top-line growth by the end of the year. Leverage at the end of the quarter remains below our long-term target of two times as we balance cash returns with capacity to pursue our M&A agenda. We returned approximately $700 million to shareholders this quarter through dividends and a $500 million share repurchase. While M&A is our top capital allocation priority, cash returns to shareholders remain a key component of our TSR algorithm. Now turning to our updated fiscal 2020 outlook. As you saw in the release this morning, we are adjusting our fiscal 2020 outlook following our performance this holiday season and increased visibility for the full year. We now expect revenue to be about $11.75 billion, representing 7% growth on an organic constant dollar basis. Excluding occupational work brands, our updated outlook represents growth of over 8%. By brand, we're raising our outlook for vans to about 15% growth, which compares to our prior expectation of 13 to 14% growth. We're tightening the outlook for the North Face to about 9% growth. We now expect Timberland to decline between 1% and 2%, which compares to our prior expectation of 1% to 2% growth. And lastly, we're holding our outlook for Dickies at 5% to 6% growth as the business continues to gain momentum. We expect our strategic growth platforms, D2C and international, to continue to perform well through the remainder of fiscal 2020. We now expect growth in D2C to, to be between 10 and 11% versus our prior expectation of 12 to 13% growth. And from a geographic perspective, we now expect our international business to increase about 9%, which compares to our prior outlook of 8 to 9% growth. We continue to see gross margin expanding 80 basis points to 54.1% and operating margin expanding 90 basis points to 13.8%. We now expect EPS to approximate $3.30, representing about 18% growth. This compares to our prior outlook of 3.32 to 3.37, which represented 19 to 21% growth. Relative to our prior outlook, the reduction in EPS was driven by the performance of Timberland brand and the occupational work brands partially offset by strength in the Vans brand. As we head into the last quarter of the fiscal year, we are on track to deliver revenue and earnings growth at or above the long-term commitments we laid out in Beaver Creek in late September. Three of our four largest brands are performing at or above their long-term growth objectives and as a reminder, our top two brands, the Vans and the North Face, account for 
eight, over 80% of our growth in the long-range plan. Our strategic growth platforms, international and D2C, are strong and well-positioned to sustain their growth momentum heading into fiscal 2021. And given our intended actions with our work segment, we're taking another step to optimize our portfolio, simplify our business, and elevate our focus on our largest properties and growth opportunities. The fundamentals of our business are strong. We are executing well, and we remain confident in our long-range organic plan and our ability to deliver on our mid-team TSR commitment. And our balance sheet is primed and positioned to capitalize on M&A opportunities that have the potential to drive incremental growth and value creation to our organic plan. So with that, we'll now turn the call back to the operator and take your questions. Thank you. We'll now be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to be placed in the question queue, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to move your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing star 1. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Our first question today is coming from Bob Durbel from Guggenheim Securities. Your line is now live. Hey, guys. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, j just two questions for me. I guess the, the first one is, on the Timberland performance, can you just talk to sort of the, you know, the turn in Timberland or sort of, you know, what needs to happen within that business and sort of the timeline on it? And then the, the second question that I have is just, can you can you expand a little bit more on, you know, your inventory levels and, and sort of maybe inventories in the channel in terms of what you see heading into calendar 2020? Thanks. Sure. Good morning, Bob. This is Steve. Um, so, Timberland, um, let me just be really frank with everybody. We, we are not pleased with our performance. Uh, we're disappointed, and our assumption is you are um, disappointed as well. And where we find ourselves, you know, is, is this is an iconic brand with deep, rich heritage. And we remain very committed to the strategy that we laid out to you all in Beaver Creek. Um, a lot of foundational work has been done around the brand you know, to, to really understand the consumer and put together the brand architecture that helps drive the most important aspects of our strategy, which is elevating our product. You know, we've talked to you a lot about diversity. Uh, diversifying our product offer. Um, we absolutely need to do that to move beyond classics um, in our men's business to the non-classics, but we have to continue to see good growth in our women's apparel and pro businesses. And uh, concurrent with that is we have to find a way to, you know, more intimately connect and engage with consumers um, as we drive, you know, the new brand foundation forward. Um, we are not where we'd like to be. Um, but I think you know, we are very, very convicted you know, that this brand is one that our skills can absolutely unlock, and the diversification strategy that we have in place um, absolutely gives us confidence that we can be done. I think it's interesting, if you look at the results this quarter, um, our, our apparel business was strong, our pro business was strong, our, wiz our women's business contributed, um, and if, in aggregate, those businesses are about half of the total Timberland uh, revenue. Where we need to continue to grow um, is in the men's classic and non-classics. And we laid out that vision in Beaver Creek of the work that needs to be done you know, with the new design teams, the new merchandising skills uh, to drive that turnaround. And uh, we remain very convicted, um, but don't, don't, don't let me uh, leave you thinking that we're at all pleased. We're disappointed and uh, uh, continue to to work very hard with the with the leadership teams there at Timberland you know, to put this business in the right place. Yeah, and Bob, uh, as it relates to the inventory levels, I, I think you're talking about retail inventories, and 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 uh, you know Steve's comments and mine as well talked about a mixed holiday performance, a little little softer than uh, our expectation in, in, a, in a few areas, and. The, the knock-on effect of that is uh, inventory levels are a little elevated. Um, you know, we also know that the promotional environment started a little earlier and went deeper uh, than than uh, we were in some cases. And so, what we've uh, laid out is a plan for the balance of the year to 
uh, address that. We think that's baked into our guidance. And as I said in the prepared remarks, our expectation is both from our inventory and from a retail inventory that we'll exit this year uh, in good shape. So back in you know three months, and we'll give you an update on on how that progressed. Great. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Our next question today is coming from Dana Telsey from Telsey Advisory Group. Your line is now live. Hi. G good morning, everyone. As you think Thanks. about the performance by, by region, certainly seems like EMEA and China did well. Any breakout by brand on what happened in the Americas by channel, whether it's wholesale or direct in terms of what you're seeing? And then just on vans, um, what we should be looking for there going forward. You took up the guidance to 15% for the full year. What should we look for as we go to fiscal 21? Thank you. Hey, Dana, this is Steve. Um, so, you know, I think you, you absolutely captured um, our international business was was quite good. Um, Europe continues to, to do well um, in an environment that isn't necessarily that strong, and our, our Asia business led by China um, you know, continues to perform very well. Here in the U.S., you know, to our prepared remarks, we saw um, an uptick in the promotional activity um, starting pretty early and specifically with our cold weather brands. And uh, the result there really, you know, hit the north face in Timberland. And, um, you know, we saw a drop in traffic in our retail. And, uh, you know, the notes, and uh, you can see it in our slides, um, we did see a, a reduction in, uh, in growth within our, our brick and mortar. In the case of Vans, we had, you know, good e-commerce pickup. Um, but we saw weakness in the North Face and Timberland um, on that e-commerce side. And we do really relate that to um, the early you know, promotional activity. Um, we did not respond. Um, you know, I think if you remember back three, four years, you know, we did quite a bit of work around you know, right-sizing you know, the, the channel to distribution, shoring up the promotional activity um, that we participated in. And we really took the long view and uh, wanted to preserve the integrity and quality of our brand position. And uh, with our, within our own environments, we did not chase that, that uh, promotional environment. You know, some might argue that we should have, um, but we really do believe that from a long view, shoring up that, that quality um, and integrity of the brand position is very, very important. Um, but I also would tell you, you know, in the case of our North Face business, um, we are, you know, rebuilding a team, you know, that just went through a very significant, you know, relocation. And uh, in that, our D2C and digital teams um, are, are new. You know, we believe we've got a, a very strong, if not stronger, team. And our ability to now really engage and drive that particular platform uh, will be back in our control um, as this team settles into their new position and, uh, and understands that the, the total brand, you know, strategy that they're driving. Yeah, and Dana, uh, relative to your question on vans, you know, I guess the, the the big picture answer is we really don't see anything fundamentally different, right? We just did a 15%, which we know is ahead of our long-range plan, but we also talked about the, uh, you know, uh, soft landing or or, uh, or controlled descent, uh, whatever you want to call it, but uh, we, we planned on and we really don't see anything fundamentally different on a, on a forward basis. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Our next question is coming from Michael Bonetti from Credit Suisse. Your line is now live. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking our questions here. Um, I wanted to ask about um, vans and actives, the active segment margins for a second. Um, they were down a little bit in the quarter, but you, you guys went through a, a huge period of growth with vans um, and the margins being down in this quarter after being up a lot in the first half of the year. As, as we look ahead to next year um, in your fiscal 21, how should we think about the margin um, compression that we saw in third quarter. I know you have some tough comparisons lapping the first half of this year, and then I know the longer term structural drivers like D2C and International um, drive this higher over the long term. So it's easy to see that being the case as you get into you know the second half of your fiscal year next year. But I'm thinking more in the near term, does the margin need to normalize a little bit in the first half of next year while you lap those big comp growth rates and margin expansion from the first half of fiscal 20? Yeah, Michael, great, great question. So, you know, the, the uh, third quarter, you really have to look, broaden out and look at the full, uh, the full year picture because there is some timing quarter to quarter. 
what you should expect for the full year is that the margin growth rate will more or less approximate the, the top line growth rate. And that was the way we planned this business because we're investing back into the growth of bands. And that was uh, something I think we've been talking about for, for a while here. And, okay. you know, the great news with, with this business is, given its uh, gross margin profile, uh, that is really the, the fuel that allows us to continue to invest back into the business. So as, as we look forward, we don't see anything structurally different. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, give guidance for next year at this point. But, right. uh, you know, those gross margins and that growth rate will continue to fuel the investment uh, capacity to allow us to invest back into the brand. <laughs> Okay, let me let me back up and ask about um, some of the Beaver Creek uh, stuff for a second. Um, I'm trying to roll forward the algorithm you laid out just a few months ago at that analyst day, given what we know about the occupational group at this point. So if our starting point was a seven to eight year, uh, sorry, a seven to eight percent revenue CAGR for five years, does that does the sale of occupational move us up to the eight to nine range for the next five years? And I know the occupational business has higher margins, about fifteen percent than the overall company, but I guess we don't know what the gross margin or SG&A improvement was baked into the plan relative to the corporate algorithm. So could you just help us think about how the sale influences the plans for, you know, about 40 basis points of EBIT margin expansion per year and EPS of 12 to 14% per year? Yeah, you know, so again, we're not, we're not going to revise the, the long-term algorithm. Uh, you know, I'd say, Michael, it's not materially different. And if you think about the go forward, we are, you know, we know today that certain things are developing somewhat differently. Uh, Timberland is a little slower uh, in its acceleration curve. That's moving to the right. On the other hand, you're right. The sale of occupational will have uh, a tailwind from a growth standpoint. But I, I guess at this point, we're not changing our full view, and, and we don't really see a material difference. Okay. Thanks a lot for the help. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Erin Murphy from Piper Sandler. Your line is now live. Great. Thanks. Good morning. Um, a couple questions for me. I guess first just on the North Face. I think you guys indicated that the men's business performed much better than the women's. Can you just kind of expound on what drove that? Um, was it competition in the women's side that maybe it was a little bit softer? And uh, relatedly with the future light, <clears throat> excuse me, you've had it for four months in your direct channel. Can you just talk about the rollout strategies over the next 12 months um, our wholesale account starting to book for spring. Where should we see it uh, kind of show up? Great. Yeah, Aaron, I'll take your question. <clears throat> so, you know, good call out. You know, our men's business in the North Face was, was good. Uh, we saw solid growth um, across really all three of the of the brand territories: Mountain Sports, Mountain Life, and Urban X. But you know, really, I think it was the Mountain Life and Urban X where we saw you know strong growth. Um, our, women, our women's business in the Americas um, underperformed, and uh, you know, to my earlier comments around the, you know, the you know, the early move to promotional environment, uh, we believe had an impact um, on our business. Um, you know, potentially, you know, there was some increased competition, and um, you know, that uh, may have taken some of that. But I think it really comes down to our market segmentation strategy and how we've set our businesses up to succeed. <clears throat> and uh, going forward, you know, the North Face can really take learnings out of this quarter and apply it to next fall um, as they <clears throat> think about the wholesale and retail mix of those core women's style. Um, women's continues to be one of the primary growth drivers that are already laid out in the Beaver Creek um, conversation, and uh, it's a very, very important aspect of the long-term growth. We, we really see this as a, an, a point in time, not, not a long-term trend, and one that we you know, feel confident uh, will not be you know, one that repeats. On the future like question, um, really, you know, we're really happy you know, with, with how, where we are. You know, we're seeing that you know, in the prepared remarks you know, four times you know, the sales of the, um, of the Summit Steep and Flight Series, you know, where future light products are represented. We really have, you know, been able to really reposition, you know, the brand with these collections with that core consumer. Uh, what we've found um, is that the educational element of future light is, is a significant task um, in, in, the, in the future, and we've invested heavily around um, you know, driving the brand and driving the its education, but this is such a disruptive innovation in how the garment 
feels, how the garment performs, is markedly different, you know, than anything, you know, that we've seen um, and been able to use over the last 30 years. And the work to drive that education, that understanding will continue into, you know, fiscal 21, fiscal 22, as the product line, you know, continues to expand. You will see an expanded offer in spring 20, uh, going on market in, in rainwear um, and moving into some more approachable price points. Um, the drizzle uh, rain jacket at 229 will be the opening price point with Future Life. Um, that is a very strong historical seller, and uh, we think this will be uh, yet another moment to, to really raise the awareness, inform the consumer, and uh, as we do that, you know, continue to set ourselves up for future expansion um, in the coming fall and uh, years after. Thank you. I appreciate that. And then just one quick follow-up for Scott. Scott, just on the digital growth, I think you guys referenced why it was weaker and at 17% with just Timberland and North Face. But how do you see digital growing in the fourth quarter? And as we get into 2021, 20, uh, should it return back to the longer-term CAGR of 24 to 25%? Thank you. Yeah, we, you know, I think Steve unpacked what we uh, understand at this point are the, are the drivers for why we saw the, the moderated performance. We're obviously taking some actions. I mentioned some of those uh, um, in terms of promotion, also just in the way that we're communicating and, and uh, the feedback loop. You know, one of the things that we have is good insight into uh, consumer feedback, and we're making adaptions uh, where we can. So. We'll see some uh, some improvement, but um, not all the way back to the, the long-term algorithm. Going forward, we see um, we're, we, we see no reason why we can't achieve that. Uh, again, the, the reasons for the underperformance, I think Steve uh, unpacked earlier. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Sam Poser from Susquehanna. Your line is now live. Um, good morning. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, I just want to follow up. I have two questions. One to follow up on Timberland, and and what's really you know you know what's being done there to sort of invigorate the I, I would call it the the core heritage business other away from what uh, the classic um, you know yellow boot type businesses, uh, and and when will we? Um, potentially begin to see that in earnest given the, the, the current deceleration and, and, and miss of plans. Great. Good morning, Sam. Um, so, you know, fair question um, and one that I absolutely expected from you. Um, you know, we, um, in my earlier comments around, you know, Timberland and the classics business, you know, with, with um, as, as Martino laid out in Beaver Creek, you know, we've done a lot of work um, over the last, you know, couple years of really understanding the consumer um, and really helping us reframe and rethink the brand brand architecture and how that drives the creative aspect of the business. You know, we've, as we laid out, we've added, you know, new design talent, Christopher Rayburn coming on, um, you know, the teams, you know, that, you know, that uh, surround him, the merchandising organization. Um, Sam, what we have to do is not only diversify the product, um, but we have to elevate the product. Um, and we need to really think about the aesthetic. We need to think about the finish. Uh, we're opening up some new sourcing avenues, accessing better better manufacturing, um, which will put a, a an elevated offer um, from both the materials and aesthetic into the into the consumer frame. Um, the samples that you know that we're seeing right now give us confidence. That's why earlier on I said we remain very convicted. You know that this is a brand that we can that we can drive, and um, I think. To your point on timing, it, um, I think you're not going to see it in a dramatic way in fiscal 21. Um, to Scott's comment, you know, we, you know, we, we, we don't see fiscal 21 as a, as a year where we're going to see breakout performance, you know, across the full assortment. We do think our apparel business will continue to drive good double-digit growth as we're seeing right now. Um, our pro business will continue to be a good performer. Um, our women's business here in the Americas is good and will continue to drive that. Um, but the energy around the men's classic and the non-classic diversification um, will be a major focus, and it will really be that following year where we think you'll start to see the evidence and the proof points of that work. And uh, you know, really driving off that rich heritage, 
um, tapping into that outdoor, you know, heritage and those styles that, uh, that you know so well, um, you know, will be you know, really top of mind for us. Yeah, Sam, I, I'd just like to add on, too, as we think about um, where we're at in this brand and, and what, you know, the, the, the near to midterm looks like, just to build on Steve's comment, remember, part of our strategy is to build the diversified offer, the more lifestyle um, offer, and we have some evidence of that, as, as Steve mentioned, with apparel, but that really enables our D2C growth. But the reality is this brand today has about 25% of the overall distribution sitting in D2C. So that large wholesale footprint, particularly in the U.S., uh, coupled with the performance we just had at Holiday and, and the, uh, you know, the attendant uh, inventory uh, overhang that, that comes with that, means we're going to struggle to grow next year as many of the wholesalers base their next year buys and, and the order books are set based on the performance they just saw. So I think we have to have a, you know, a sober assessment of where we're at. And, and next year, we're not giving guidance per se, but we will, we will struggle to grow as we look at next year in the Timberland brand. Thank you. And then, and then secondly, um, can you give us some idea of the percent of sales uh, within the occupational work business by quarter, uh, just to help us, uh, you know, sort of forecast forward, uh, you know, with and without that business. And can you give us some idea of um, how you're foreseeing um, the occupational be business to be on a year-over-year -year basis uh, in full year 20 now that we're almost through it, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the release from last year's revenue? Yeah, so on the first part, you know, there is some seasonality, but it's fairly balanced um, on a, on a full-year uh, basis, Sam. And I'm sorry, could you repeat the second part of your question? Can you give us some idea? You know, it was $835 million or $65 million last year. Can you give us some idea of where you're thinking that's going to end up this year? Or where yeah, it is uh, right? Yeah, um, right, flat, flat, flat to slightly down. Uh, is where we see it for the for the balance of the year. And and what would be the peak quarter uh, of sales for that business? Yeah, and I'm I'm not going to get into that level of detail. Just I, I just refer you back to my earlier comment, Sam, from the page right. of the business. All right. Thanks so much. Have a great um, good Thanks, luck, Sam. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Omar Saad from Evercore ISI. Your line is now live. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, good morning. I wanted to ask about the spin-off. Actually, the spin-offs at this point, you know, now with Contour uh, in the rearview mirror and the announcement around the workwear uh, uh, decision to, to, to sell that business. Um, you know, obviously, you're, you're reshaping the portfolio to align with kind of the core competency of the company and the long-term goals. But it, it also seems like you may be clearing the decks a little bit here. Um, does it make it easier to do a larger acquisition in the future? You know, once this is uh, this like kind of last piece is done in terms of the portfolio reshaping, is that a, an appropriate way to think about it? Maybe you could frame it for us. And then I had a second question on urban exploration within the North Face. You know, what you learned uh, in the quarter. You know, how we should think about that component within the North Face uh, over the next, uh, you know, over the long term. What what the opportunity is there? Thanks. Great. So Omar, I'll start here. So. I'm not, I don't think we're in a position to talk to you about the size or magnitude of the acquisition um, that our, our last two dispositions may be putting us in a position for. Um, but what I would tell you, um, you know, that M&A remains that number one priority for capital allocation. Um, you know, we um, think we've been very clear, you know, with our total addressable market where we see the opportunity. And uh, as we simplify and focus our portfolio around, around brands that, you know, really can connect more intimately um, with consumers um, and have a, a direct contact through own distribution and, uh, and key partners. I think it gives you a good sense of, you know, where, we, where, where we're looking and uh, where we think we can add value to our portfolio. But, you know, absolute size would be difficult, um, you know, to really call out for you right now. Yeah, and I'd just build on the, the focus and simplification of the model really – helps as you think about future activity, right? So one just data point X, or at the end of this transaction, our portfolio at, at 12 brands will be roughly half of what it was just a couple of years ago. 
uh, but really aligned with that long-term growth algorithm that we laid out in Beaver Creek, you know, a, brand, a portfolio of brands that can really you know, drive that, that algorithm, uh, but also you know, benefit and drive our focus around transformation. Um, so on your, on your question on Urban X, you know, Omar, I think the learnings there um, is that the brand you know, continues to be able to appeal to and attract new consumers, uh, leveraging you know, the rich heritage uh, of some of those key icons like the Noopsy. Um, you see you know, extreme gear being pulled out of the archives. So that what they're finding is you know, this is a, a real rich area to, to leverage that historical you know, set of brand icons done in a way um, you know, that really promotes the rich heritage and authenticity and supports, you know, the more technical side of mountain sports. So um, we see good growth, you know, and uh, not only, you know, here in the U.S., but, you know, from a global standpoint, um, it's, a, it's a real strong part of that go-forward strategy. Got it. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Alex Walvis from Goldman Sachs. Your line is now live. Good morning. Thanks so much for taking the question. My first question um, is on the occupational workwear split. Um, Scott, you shared some comments on this in, in the opening remarks, but I, I wonder if you could you know, help us out with you know, where we should and shouldn't expect there to be dissynergies um, from, that, from that split. Yeah, so um, there will be some. Of it. You know, there's, I, would, I would characterize this business as moderately integrated, um, so uh, we will have some the synergies, uh, just to put a number on it, and we're, you know, in the neighborhood of $30 million is, is our expectation. Now, against that, uh, likely there will be TSA, and, and of course, we'll, we'll get after those costs over time. Uh, depends on the buyer and the circumstances, but uh, just to give you some sense of the magnitude. The other thing I would point out is uh, with this uh, action, then it greatly simplifies uh, or focuses our, our uh, supply chain as well from an own manufacturing standpoint. You know, we talked about uh, this uh, gets us out of the apparel manufacturing. So as you can imagine, that gives opportunity for uh, simplification and cost reduction as well. Great, that's helpful. And then um, if, if I may, another question on um, the North America backdrop. Um, so you shared a lot of comments on the more promotional um, environment in the holiday period. So to the extent that it's possible, um, is there a way of you know, passing through you know, how much of the weakness in North America was a softening in you know, underlying consumer confidence or spending versus um, you know, the impact of um, uh, warmer weather trends you know, versus what had been a you know, pretty, pretty a, a good winter last year? Um, it, do you guys have any any thoughts on on you know on on that split? Yeah, Alex, I don't think it's it would be really difficult. I think to really pinpoint you know what were those key drivers. You have called out you know some of them. Um, I think you know the U.S. consumer you know remains strong. Um, what we saw in in our product category, specifically cold weather product. Um, you know, was a slow start to the season. Um, you know, the quick move to the promotional environment um, certainly did have an impact. Um, but um, I could also say, um, you know, that when when brands are, are are deeply you know focused in understanding the consumer needs and putting the right products in front of the consumers at the right time, um, you can you can absolutely see um, you know the sales lift you know that we plan for. Um, so. We're not going to focus on any one of those of those key drivers. I think we're going to be very focused on our our consumer um, understanding. You know how that will help us drive a more retail centric approach to our go to market strategies, and and continue to elevate our our digital skills to, to be able to really engage and uh, and, and drive deeper uh, connections with our consumers. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Matthew Boss from J.P. Morgan. Your line is now live. Great, thanks. So on gross margin, what was the benefit this quarter from the FX transaction gains and just the expectation for the fourth quarter? And how best to think about the impact on the fourth quarter gross margin as a whole from the more promotional backdrop and elevated inventories that you cited? 
Yeah, Matt, uh, we didn't break that out per se, that, but certainly FX did benefit the third quarter, and, and it does turn negative uh, really for the first time this year in the, in the fourth quarter and, and, of course, that on an ongoing basis. Um, so uh, I, what I will say is this. You know, if you look at our implied guidance, the fourth quarter would, would say um, that our implied margin in the fourth quarter is down a bit. Um, underneath that, the, the structural gross margin mix remains strong. It's there, and that will continue on an ongoing basis. Uh, the two factors, one you mentioned, is the, the FX, and this we're talking about transactional FX, which relates to hedges put in place over the last, you know, 12 to 18 months or so. And, uh, you know, that's something we've been talking about for a long time. That now turns negative in the quarter. Also, while tariffs not a big impact overall or even for the year, we do see for the first time the negative tariff impact in the fourth quarter. Now, interestingly, on a go-forward basis, based on where we're at right now, tariffs seem to be about a, a, a push year on year. And, and again, really relatively small in the overall scheme of things. So that's what's going on in gross margin, right? The change in the FX cadence underneath it, you got a continued uh, mixed benefit, which is structural and will continue, and then a little bit of noise on, on the tariff. One final thing, I alluded to this in my earlier comments as well, uh, relative to the inventory uh, being a little elevated in certain pockets, we also factor in to be a little more market appropriate from a promotional cadence standpoint, and that's also baked in to our guidance as you look at the fourth quarter. Great. And then just to follow up on the portfolio pruning, so I guess maybe larger picture, how should we be thinking about the strategy moving from pruning to M&A, and how would you prioritize maybe best particular categories of increased interest on the radar? I think within that core addressable market that you outlined at the analyst day. Yeah, so so you went right where I was going to start, which is that that uh, those TAMs, the total addressable market, is where we're uh, focused. And and remember the three lenses that we look at: both the portfolio that we have and the portfolio uh, targets that we evaluate. You know, it's it's really pretty consistent and straightforward. We're looking at is it an, strategically is it is it an attractive segment of the market financially does it meet the characteristics that we're looking for and from an ownership standpoint do we bring something to the party is it consistent with our uh, uh, with our purpose and does it meet the profile of, of the target uh, investor that that we're going after so you know I think in that is a pretty good explanation of the of the actions that we've taken and also gives you a pretty good indication of the kind of areas that we're looking from an acquisition standpoint. Great, thanks. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Jim Duffy from Stiefel. Your line is now live. Thanks. Good morning. Um, guys, two lines of questioning for me. First, uh, we've heard a lot about the U.S. market dynamics in the quarter. Can you speak to Asia? Is there a way to size the impact of the Hong Kong disruption? And can you speak to what you're seeing relative to expectations in other countries? Maybe I'll put some numbers on it first. So, our, you know, our Hong Kong business is important. It's been a good business, but it's not that large in the scheme of things. I think we set it, you know, in the, in the 100 million range uh, overall. And, and that has been significantly impacted uh, through the year. And uh, we really haven't seen much of a change in trend um, relative to Hong Kong uh, you know, interestingly, we'll start to lap that. We were just having that conversation internally here. As we get into the new year, we'll, we'll start to uh, lap when we started to see uh, those issues. Um, the good news for us is that China in the, in the region has really been strong, and you saw 30%. That's a somewhat um, artificial. We said there's about five points due to the timing of Chinese New Year. So there's a little quarter-to-quarter -quarter noise in that. But still, if you look, we've been in that 25-plus kind of growth range consistently in China, and, and that's really driven the strength of, of Asia and, and really why we're at the top end of our uh, long-range uh, estimates overall. Great. I wanted to dig in some on the inventory. Can you guys speak in more detail on the geographic and, and brand level inventory picture? It seems inventory is most out of balance for the vocational work business in Timberland. 
Uh, can you talk about plans to get the inventories back in line and, and the financial impact? And then, Scott, is that cleaned up in the fiscal fourth quarter, or is there some lingering impact as we go into fiscal 21? Yeah, so so you're talking about our inventory, obviously. And, uh, yeah, so we're – if you look at the ongoing core inventory, we're up like 8%. Uh, and as we think about going forward, we said, uh, you know, we'd be balanced uh, between uh, revenue and sales. So – Long way of saying we're, we think we're okay from an inventory standpoint by the end of the year. Any actions that may be taken, we believe, are baked into the outlook, and and uh, so we, we'd say you know pretty good. So obviously, what that means if we're plus 12 for the um, the um, the um, uh, occupational business is is really elevated, right? Now it's a it's a unique model because in that business. Um, you have specific customers. You have to. It's all about service. You maintain the inventory, and most of these agreements actually have a clause that says, should there be excess at the end of the program, that then they will buy that. They'll take that inventory. So it's good inventory. We just have too much of it. Uh, is the short answer. And as you can imagine, given the the uh, uh, actions that we recently announced, you know, taking uh, radical or very costly short term. Uh, actions to try to reduce the inventory wouldn't make a whole lot of sense because it's good quality inventory and, and eventually it's going to be uh, it's going to be used. So hopefully that gives gives the, the picture. It does. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Jonathan Comp from Baird. Your line is now live. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Um, Steve, maybe just a follow up more related to Timberland and. Portfolio management actions. I, I guess it's it's very clear your history when parts of the business aren't meeting your strategic and financial goals. You've been very quick to take action, but in the case of like Timberland, where it very clearly fits strategically but is not is not necessarily hitting your financial goals, could you maybe just talk more philosophically about kind of your patience and willing to see things out and and any any thoughts there? Sure. Well, I would I would start, you know, that, you know, our our willingness to to look at divestitures, you know, really has come online the last three years. Um, so as we've re, as we have made, you know, driving and shaping our portfolio our number one uh, strategic choice, um, and and really focusing now on on the parts of the market that uh, you know we laid out with the total addressable market in Beaver Creek, you know, how we characterize our brands as you know, global, you know, activity-based lifestyle brands that connect, can, you know, can connect directly with consumers, you know, with their predominance uh, through their own and, and digital channels. You know, that, that frame has helped us really look at what brands we feel we're best at, or said differently, where are we the best owner, and where are we not the best owner. And what we've trimmed um, are really good brands, but, but brands that don't really align with that long-term, long-term view. To the point on Timberland, um, it absolutely aligns, you know, with with the the consumer, you know, the position in the marketplace and the ability to connect with consumers. Um, my earlier points that you know we're disappointed in in our ability to execute, um, in our in our conviction around the strategy, you know, that we have been working on, you know, really over the last 18 to 24 months um, that our that Martino articulated in Beaver Creek. Um, we don't have endless patience. Um, we certainly, you know, have a very focused approach and, uh, and clear sets of KPIs that we will, you know, look for our brand teams, all brand teams, to deliver on a year-over-year -year basis. Um, but but I, I really want you all to leave this call knowing that we, we are still deeply committed to the Timberland brand. You know, we, we, we understand, you know, where the issues are. You know, my comments around, the, you know, not only the diversification of the product, but the, the, but the quality in the aesthetic of the product across all of the different growth drivers, um, we will you know, we will keep you very close on how we're how we're doing there. We'll give you the proof points um, as this strategy starts to take hold. Um, but we do not have endless patience, and um, you know it is really around the proof points and the KPIs that we work with on a on a year over year basis with our brands um, that will ultimately drive the decisions long term. <coughs> Okay, that's very helpful. And then just separately as you look out to 2021, I, I think 
this time last year you gave some high level thoughts on a few of the brands for the year ahead. Um, you didn't give that this year. So I'm just wondering maybe outside of Timberland, just at a high level, is there anything across the brands that you would think is kind of beyond or, or different than maybe closer to the long-term plan that you've laid out when you look across the brands? You know, Jonathan, not really. Uh, I mean, we fundamentally believe uh, we're uh, not in a different environment. Uh, we see the, the long-range plan that we just talked about in September as as intact. Now, obviously, a few pieces are moving, as I mentioned. I, I think on uh, on uh, Benetti's question, uh, structurally, you're going to see with the with the sale of occupational, that's a tailwind to growth. The, what we just talked about in Timberland is a bit of a headwind, but overall, we don't see ourselves in a fundamentally different place. And I'd just like to remind you, as you think about this year and the and the guidance change or the outlook change that we just talked through, you know, the the uh, uptick in vans, the uh, the uh, adjustment in uh, Timberland essentially are a wash, and what's left is the occupational reduction. So using different words, if it weren't for occupational, we'd still be in the range that we talked about um, three months ago, and, and, and I would say that's really the big picture. So if you look at the ongoing algorithm for VF, which will obviously exclude the occupational work group, uh, we say, yeah, evolved a little differently, but more we don't see anything fundamentally different on a go-forward basis. But in three months, we'll be back. We'll give you guidance for next year and and uh, clean up the details. This is very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Our final question today is coming from Ike Burrochow from Wells Fargo. Your line is now live. Hey, uh, thanks for taking the question. Just, um, Scott, two questions for you. Just to follow up one more time on the inventory, the slower than expected uh, uh, growth. Um, in that category, is that all cold weather? Is that outerwear? Is, is that outerwear and footwear? I'm just kind of curious is, if there's any more color you can kind of give there, and then any more color on the types of channels where that inventory, uh, where the slow moving inventory was. Was that broad based? Was it your DTC? Was yeah. it you know, department stores? Just and, and any more color there would be really helpful. Yeah, really, I, I'd say the Ike, it was mixed, is, is the answer. I mean, certain categories we saw relatively uh, better sell-through, and others we saw uh, not quite as uh, strong. You know, some of the some of the more insulated uh, colder weather jackets, as Steve mentioned, uh, women's versus men's. Uh, and, and really, again, of course, Timberland having such a large classic uh, business, some of that uh, classic boot inventory, that – those are the main areas, but I would say, you know, listen, even retailer to retailer, some are in great shape, some have relatively more, and we look at it over overall, we would say slightly elevated, right? Not a not a disaster, not a not a huge issue, but uh, a little more than we would like to see, and that's why we're taking some of the actions that I mentioned uh, uh, earlier. And, and again, to the best of our knowledge, we've got it built into our our outlook, and uh, we have a good path to exit in good shape. Uh, obviously, not all those levers are within our control, and, and in three months, we'll give you an update on, on how that played out and give you an indication of where we stand going into next year. Got it. Thanks, Scott. And then just one quick follow-up. Just when we think about um, what you're trying to monetize the, the work we're asset for, should we look at um, the Dickies transaction to give us you know some, some kind of guidance? I know you can't tell us what you're trying to sell it for, but uh, just kind of curious the framework that maybe you're, you're using when you think about that. Yeah, of course, I'm not going to negotiate against myself here. So, um, but but yeah, you can look at comparable transactions. I would say this. Interestingly, the uh, interest for this asset has been uh, exceedingly high, and frankly, uh, higher than we expected. So, both on the sponsor side and the and the uh, strategic side. So, uh, you know, we're optimistic, but we'll let's let's see where that plays out. We'll have visibility of that in the next couple months. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. We've reached end of our question and answer session. I'd like to turn the floor back over to Steve for any further closing comments. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. Um, just going to reiterate, our third quarter performance um, is strong, and our year-to-date results are at the high end of our long-term growth objectives, and we're on track to deliver solid performance for this year. As we look at the, you know, the market signals that you know, we continue to monitor, um, our focus on transforming to become more consumer-minded retail-centric, and more hyper-digital in how we operate our business could not be more timely. 
um, the moves we're making with our portfolio um, will allow us to have greater focus not only by management but also how we invest against our brand properties but also our transformation agenda to put us in a much stronger position in the future um, as we drive against you know the LRP that we laid out for you all in Beaver Creek. Uh, we look forward to you know catching up with you all in May and, and giving you insight into how we look at fiscal 2021 and our continued um, drive against that long-range plan. Thanks. Thank you. That does conclude today's teleconference. You may disconnect your line at this time and have a wonderful day. We thank you for your participation today.